Praise the Lord, church, like when we went back to another online service. I uh, just want to give you a, a quick update. Coming up on June 27th, uh, all Sunday school classes will be opened back up for in-person lessons. Um, and so it's going to be just like we did it before, church, like the, the pre-COVID days. Um, we'll still continue to record and post these lessons, uh, you know, like we do for the Sunday services for those of you who, who aren't here or aren't able uh, to attend. Normally we've been getting up to Sunday services about 6 in the evening, uh, but now that we're going to be back full time, that's going to be pushing us later in the afternoon, and then the file to upload is going to be a whole lot bigger. So it may be late Sunday evening or uh, Monday morning, but we promise to get it up to you uh, as soon as possible. Remember to send any prayer requests, um, praise reports, names added to our prayer list to cljcrequests at gmail.com, and please still continue to pray and fast for Zach Carter. Uh, today we'll be on lesson two. Uh, it's rightly dividing the word. Focus thought is to know Jesus in his fullness, we should be diligent in studying God's word. Focus first is 2 Timothy 2 and 15. Say to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Lesson text is 2 Timothy 2 14 through 19. Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenius and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrew the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, God, we thank you. God, we thank you for the opportunity. God, thank you for your blessings, your mercy, and your grace. God, thank you for keeping cancer out of the church, our travelers safe, our soldiers safe, just all the blessings you've done for us. Thank you for the opportunity to be here again. God, thank you for the opportunity to get your word out to spread it. I just want to let this message be a light. God, let it prick someone's heart. Let it change someone's life. God, let it change all our lives to see that we need to study, God, that we need to dig into your word. And God, not just glance over it, but actually delve deep into it. And that's how we grow deeper with you. That's how we grow as Christians, God, to get into your word and I ask Lord to, to bless the service. God, use it for that building king. Let people be faithful and watch. And again, God, let it change someone's life. Let them uh, ignite that passion to study in your word. And bless all the people that are suffering from this fire still. God, we well, thank you for bringing the numbers down here, but touch all those nations where, where it's rising up again. God, and all the, the distress that's in the world, God, bring peace to it. God, bless your churches. Keep everyone united and, and together in this time. Give your pastors wisdom and knowledge in this day. God, we we'll give you all the praise and the glory for it all, Lord. In yes. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> so Wayne likes to say, you may be seated. Uh, the book starts by mentioning uh, the, the rise in popularity of you know, DIY home projects, upgrades to your home that you can try and accomplish yourself. <clears throat> but, um, you know, there's tons of videos, you go on YouTube, you'll, you'll find a whole lot of things, even home improvement stores have, have videos that, that will walk you through the process that you used to have to hire a professional to do. You wanna lay down some new laminate flooring in your house, you could pay a contractor a decent amount of money to, to do that, but with a little research online and a little of your own time, you could handle that little project on your own. But then there are times it pays just to call a professional. Yeah. Just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should do something. I, I know what a lot of tools do, but I'm not skilled enough to use those tools in the proper manner. I've patched a couple tiny holes in drywall but I know there's no way I could hang drywall and mud it and sand and paint and make everything look nice and neat and smooth and perfect. If I were to do a whole room, I would hire someone who knows what they're doing. When we installed the, the new sound system for the church a couple of years ago, we actually consulted someone who was a professional. He's been doing this for decades. He knew the ins and outs of the equipment that we were getting. He's the one that recommended the single speaker that we have uh, in the middle. You know, I was thinking we were going to need at least two, but he, 
he was dead on. He said, trust me, you're going to need one. And it turns out he was right because he knew what he was talking about. And his advice was, was beneficial because he had experience in the industry. Experience and knowledge are crucial for success in, in anything you want to do, and that includes using the Word of God. Like the book said, just because you, you have a Bible, that doesn't mean you're automatically you know, going to be a successful or an effective minister just because you have the Bible right there with you. Paul in his letters to Timothy offers him some advice and some guidance in becoming an effective minister. And having the Word is just one part, and knowing how to use it in the right way is another part of the ministry. Paul's writings in 2 Timothy is believed to be one of his, his final writings, if not the last one, written as his life was coming to an end. If you listen to our series on Acts, you've learned quite a bit on the, the, the life of Paul the Apostle. In his letter to, to Timothy, Paul refers to him as Timothy, my son. Uh, and you get mixed emotions as you read this book, uh, uh, 2 Timothy. Paul knows his days are coming to an end. He knows his life is about to end. Yet he looks forward to his reward in heaven. But there's also some sadness here, too. And, and over the past year, like I said, we learned quite a bit about Paul, how he started as a persecutor of the church, his conversion, his preaching and teaching, his missionary trips, starting churches, battling and suffering at all for the church and for the name of Jesus. And all of the writings that he did, he composed a lot of the New Testament. And now here he sits writing to someone that he viewed as a son. He had done so much to further the gospel, and there's no telling how many people uh, had been saved during his missionary trips and, you know, and all his, his ministry. And there's no telling how many miracles God worked you know, during that time of his ministry. But now at the end of it, he's all by himself pretty much. 2 Timothy 4, 9 through 11 says, Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed unto Thessalonica, and Crescens to Galatia, and Titus unto Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Everyone else is gone, but only Luke remains with me. And now all those that had worked with him, they've all now gone. They've abandoned him. No crowds, no big revivals, just him and Luke there in that room together. In 2 Timothy 4 and 16, he says, At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. He's saying at my first answer, at my first trial, not a single person stood with me. When Paul arrived in Italy, they came to a spot about uh, 120 to 140 miles outside of Rome, and there are people from 30 and 40 miles away, and that was a big, that was a, you know, a somewhat decent journey back in those days. They traveled that distance just to come out and greet Paul, and as they got closer to Rome, people kept coming and coming from away just to see him. People begged him. They said, tarry with us for a whole week, and all these people were happy to see him, yet when it came time for his trial, not a single person was there to stand with him. When times got tough, Everyone vanished from Paul. People came to see him for two years, but now at the end of his life, it's only him and Luke. And as a minister and as a Christian, Paul is a great example to Timothy, and he was a great example to, to all of us, and he showed us how to keep standing no matter what happens. And he had the word, and he also lived by it. He didn't let any circumstance change how he served God. When the big crowds and the miracles were going, he still faithfully served God. When the shipwrecks the beings, the being left for dead, uh, jailed, and now facing his death sentence, he still continued to serve God right up until the end. People nowadays find the, the most ridiculous reasons to give up or not even decide to come to church. And what if on Judgment Day Jesus would ask us, he said, you know, Paul served me in chains. He served me knowing that he was about to die. What excuses do you have? What hinders you from coming and serving me? What did hinder you from serving me? And, and I highly doubt that any of us have experienced anything like Paul had suffered or, or lived a life like Paul did. And excuses can justify things in our minds, in our flesh. It can make us feel at ease. But God sees through every single excuse that we have. You know, we should strive to walk and live how Paul did. Stay standing when things get tough. Cling to God 
and still seen. And I say all this about, about Paul uh, to give a small backdrop to the book of 2 Timothy. These, these are his last words, as I said. Some of his last advice that he's going to give. And he spent that time writing about how to be an effective minister and studying and knowing how to use the words of God. The, the fact that these are some of his very last words should underscore the importance of what he was trying to tell Timothy and you know that being passed down to us. It's like Paul passing down his torch. He's saying, my, my time is done. My race is over. He wrote to Timothy, but it also applies to us as well. He says, it's over for me, but here's what you need to do to continue doing the work. And he gave many instructions, but one of the first ones that he gave was to study the Word. He said, study to show thyself approved unto God. Whatever your role as a preacher, a teacher, uh, a minister, or someone that just goes around and witnesses, or you're in a church member, whatever your role is, every single person has a role in the church, and everyone, that role, everyone, every role that you play, everyone should study the Word of God, and you must know the Word of God to be an effective whatever your role is, or to even be an effective Christian. To know the to work, <laughs> excuse me, know the Word of God. The school I'm in now it, it allows me to work at my own pace. I can take as many classes as I want. I take as few classes as I want. I knocked out a couple classes in, in a couple hours because I'd already known the material. I learned it, you know, several several years ago. But as I look ahead, there are some courses that are going to be a bit more difficult. Things that uh, if I look at them now go way way over my head, and it could take a couple two three months for me just to get a grasp of the concepts that are in some of those classes. And the job I want requires a certain sales get and a certain number of certifications in the industry. And the only way I can obtain those things is for me to study. I can't just sit down at a computer and mash a bunch of random keys and be like, oh, okay, you know, I know what I'm doing. It doesn't work that way. And if I study correctly and I pass those tests, then I'll receive papers <clears throat> that I can then show others that represent that I'm actually competent in that area and that I do have the skills needed for that field, that I know a thing or two. And that degree at the end is the, the university's acknowledgement that I learned what they required me to do. And the same principle goes for our spiritual lives. You know, wanting approval from God, will start. if you want that, we have to start studying in the word and says study to show thyself approved unto God and how can you be effective in whatever your role is if you don't know anything about the word of God how are you going to witness to someone hey man you need to be baptized in Jesus name why is that well that's what my pastor preaches and, you know can you show me that in the Bible well it's in there somewhere you know you think that person's really going to want to come to church with you if you don't even know what you're talking about and can you imagine the train wreck that would ensue if people that stand behind this pulpit didn't have any inkling, didn't have any knowledge of the Word of God, that we didn't know how to pray, that we didn't know how to ask God for a word in season, it wouldn't really be much of a church. It would be our opinions. And unfortunately, you do see that a lot in the world, and you see that in, in a lot of, of churches. There are prominent issues now making their way in the churches. You see a lot of leaders saying, well, here's what I think on this, or or here's what I think about that. This is my opinion of how this should be handled. And the truth is it doesn't matter what any of us think or what any of our opinions are. All that matters is what thus saith the Lord and what's in his word. And if you really want to know what he said, it's all written down for you. It's not a mystery. It's all written down in the Bible for us all to search out. When there's a lack of study, there comes a, a rise and not moving forward. There comes, you know, basically you become stagnant you're just sitting there doing nothing and i can remember one time uh my dad was watching a western and i was walking by and i seen a stagecoach and i just made the observation you know the question like oh i wonder how fast those things actually traveled during the day and of course he decided to give me some of that trademark hagen sarcasm and without missing me he said well probably about as slow or as fast as one of the slowest horses and you know, I was like, okay, but of course that did make sense because you know we've heard it many times lately. The church is is right now is nowhere near where it should be. We're a long way from becoming like the first church, but there's stuff that hinders us that keeps us from going forward. And, and one of the ways we hamstring ourselves that we slow ourselves down is by becoming lax in our study of the Word of God. We are a body, and if one part of the body 
isn't functioning correctly, it hampers your abilities, and you especially want to take care of the vital parts of your body. If your heart isn't functioning right, that's not something you just, you know, oh, I'll put that off for a few years. No, that's something you need to get taken care of right away because it's very crucial to you. If you haven't eaten in many, many days, parts of your body begin to shut down, and the same thing happens with our spiritual body. Having the Word is one of the most vital things. It's crucial to the, to the life, to our spiritual lives, to keep our spiritual bodies going. And something that we need to consume on a daily basis, like how we take in food and oxygen, is studying the Bible, studying after the Word of God every single day, trying to serve God without ever reading and studying the Word of God will probably end up badly. You probably will not make it that far. The Word is an essential aspect to all of our lives. Without it, over time, you, send, you probably just end up withering away. In 2 Timothy 3 and 16, it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The Word of God is profitable in so many ways, in so many aspects of our lives. In this letter, Paul is hammering that, that point home to Timothy, that the Word is one of the most basic and common building blocks that we need to build our lives with. He said to study, to be an effective minister, a good witness, being a Christian, it, it all revolves around studying the Word of God. And by studying the Word and using it, you get approval from God. And any type of ministry, whether it's t preaching, teaching to thousands, or you're just witnessing to a single person, whatever message you bring, you want that message to be something from God whenever... I know all of us go to prepare these messages or lessons. Everyone consults the Lord. And you heard the pastor say many times, you know, he just takes his Bible, he opens it up, points to scripture, and that's where God gives him a message. And, <clears throat> excuse me, got a little choked up there. And so when I go to <clears throat> prepare these lessons, I always ask God to let everything be from him. And I tell him, you know, if any of my thoughts are in there, take them out. I want everything, every word in there to come from God. I want it to be an approved and a timely message and, and, and a message that's in season because, uh, you know, I'm better than sliced bread and all that good stuff. But, you know, my advice still from time to time could be wrong. You know, I, I do make a mistake or two. I know Thomas is concerned. Or, you know, he's like, how's that even possible? But it is possible for me to give someone a, a piece of bad advice. But the thing about God is that his advice is never wrong and it will never lead you astray and it will always lead you in the right direction. Not on every word that we get from the Lord is going to make you feel great and not every word is going to want to make you run and jump and, you know, just shout. Uh, you know, sometimes you have to get your toes stepped on. You know, I've had my toes stepped on many times just in preparing these lessons before the word even gets to you guys. I've been slapped around quite a bit by the Lord sometimes. Uh, and I'm glad for those times. I'm glad for those toe-stomping messages that the pastor gives or, you know, other people give in the church. Paul said it was profitable for correction. And so, like I said, being smacked around every once in a while is a good thing. We need correction, and God is an expert in the correction field. He's been doing it for, for quite some time. In our lives, we should, uh, we should live in a way that is pleasing unto God, that we ask ourselves, would God approve of the life that I'm living right now? The book asks the question, why is it that we seem to value the approval of others more than we value the approval from God? It's been one of the, the long-standing issues in the church and even going back all the way to the days of Israel, that man finds it easier to conform to the world rather than conforming to what God wants. It's easier to blend in rather than to stand out. Man is a very very strange creature and some of the hardest creatures in the world to try and satisfy. When you're young, we desire to be older. We desire to look older. So looks change, makeup gets caked on, hairstyles evolve, our actions, our personality, our clothes, everything changes so we can try and appear older because that's what we just strive for. We want to be older. But then the day comes when we are the age that we once strived to be and then things get reversed. Now we want to appear younger than what we really are. So again, the hair, the makeup, the clothes, the actions, personalities, all change trying to recapture. Are you trying to get back to somewhere where we were once unhappy being and now realizing that was the best spot that we wanted 
to be with. It's hard to make man happy. We want the blessings of God, yet we don't want to put in the work to get the blessings of God. We want to have our cake and we want to eat it too. We want everything that God offers while also having everything that the world has to offer, but it doesn't work that way. You either live a life that God approves of, or you live a life where you conform to the world and the world approves of you. A life that God approves of comes by following what his word says to do, and it's basically that simple. One of the, the simplest things there is, and we have the guidebook. Like I said earlier, you know, we're not lost. It's not like we're discovering new territory here. Everything has been written down for thousands of years that we need to do. And if we study it, then we'll know the do's and the don'ts. There are tons of examples that we can see of what happens to people who didn't live a holy lifestyle that conform to the world, knowing the consequences. You know, people nowadays know the consequence of what happens when you don't live holy, but they still give in to the pressure from the world. We've talked about it before. Living right is easy. You know, living, you know, uh, for the truth is very easy. Acting, talking, dressing right, doing everything holy and acceptable unto God. It, it's easy. All of our actions, you know, doing what's right, those things are easy. But what's hard for, for man is the fear of looking different from everyone else. The Bible says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. And it says that we are a peculiar people. That means that we are strange compared to the world. We're supposed to look and act different than what the world does. Church isn't supposed to look similar to how the world does. And if people would study the Word of God, then they would know that. But you can see um, those that don't know how to rightly divide the Word of God. You see it a lot in, in churches today. The line of thinking is, you know, that if we can just get churches to somewhat mirror what the world looks like, you know, you see major church conferences doing that as well. If we can just mimic like a festival type atmosphere, we can draw younger people in and that's how we're going to get them. And they say, you know, let's not talk about sin right away. Let's not talk about salvation. Let's just not even talk about what's right and what's wrong. Let's just be uplifting. And now some churches have gone from being churches to being a place where you go for motivational speech with some musical accompaniment. There's nothing wrong with a, an uplifting message from time to time, but if you never talk about sin, if you never talk about the need for salvation, then what's it really profiting your church? The pastor can tell us every week that we're, we're the greatest thing. You know, he can say, guys, you're the greatest. And he can do that for two years in a row. And it's going to make us all feel really good about ourselves. But what is it profiting us in the long run? When you look at the Greek, uh, the words, you know, for rightly divided, the first one uh, refers to right doctrine. And the second one means to cut, but it also means to handle rightly. He's saying handle the word of God the right way. So if there's a right way to handle the word, there must also be a wrong way to handle the word of God, which is why we need to be careful about we, how we handle the word of God ourselves. It's been talked about before in messages, but it's just last year, you know, if you were on social media, you saw uh, people posting all kinds of prophecies and everything about the election. Many people were adamant, many of these people were adamant in their prophecies, but what they said never came to pass. And people got caught up really and what they wanted, and it bled over into their ministry. And, and every one of us is going to make mistakes from time to time. But when it comes to handling the Bible and the handling what you say is the word that you've gotten from the Lord, you need to handle it with extreme care and extreme respect. And now there are some people who will not listen to those ministers and will not listen to those people if they were to witness to them because their witness has been compromised because they didn't handle the word the right way. And now their witness, like I said, has been compromised in some people's eyes. Being knowledgeable and respectful of the word helps our ability to witness in the ministry. In Jude, it says to have compassion on some and on others, save them with fear, pulling them out of the fire. That's why it's crucial to know the word and to be in tune with God, to have a word in season, a timely word for anyone's situation. Sometimes you'll need strong words, sometimes even words that are hard for people. Jesus did that himself. He said, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter into heaven. And then he said, except you be converted and become as little children, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And those are some hard words 
for people to swallow, but sometimes the truth does hurt. And there's time for tough words, but then there's also times for words of compassion. There are times that people are broken, people that are feeling unloved, that they're feeling low, that they don't need a hellfire and brimstone message. They need a word of love and a word of hope. And so the main point of this message may sound a smidge repetitive, but it's something that the Lord wants to hammer into each of us, just like Paul kept doing with Timothy. And that's study the word and know how to use the word effectively in ministry. With great power comes great responsibility. So you got to know how to study the word and also know how to handle the word. Like Paul reminded Timothy, we need to be faithful in our callings. Paul told Timothy that there's a gift inside of you, Timothy, but you're the one that has to get in there. You're the one that has to stir it up. First Timothy 1, 13 through 14 says, hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. And then Second Timothy three fourteen through 16, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Hold fast and keep what you have on the inside. Keep it inside of you, Timothy. You've known the scriptures since you were a young man. These scriptures that are able to make you wise unto salvation, continue in all these things that you've been doing. Continue on in the work that we've been doing. At the beginning of chapter four, possibly like we talked about earlier, one of the, the last pieces of the letter that Paul would ever write, he says, I charge thee. He's talking to him, he's saying, I charge thee to preach the word, to be instant, to be ready at all times, in all seasons, he said, preach the word. And like Paul charged him, we must also be faithful and ready to use God's word at any time. We read the, the scriptures earlier that all scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction and instruction. In Romans, it says that scriptures, everything that was written from before time was written so we could learn. Scriptures are there for us to learn by, so we can learn how to serve God, that we can learn how to be free, that we can know how to be saved. And how do I need to be saved? Well, you learn it through studying the Word of God. You tell someone about the oneness of God, and they ask you, like I said, where's your proof? And if you know the Word, then you're going to be able to show them. But if you don't know the Word, then you're just going to look ignorant to them. Studying to understand the Bible goes past just reading the Scriptures. It, it pays to know about the times when all these books themselves were written. When Paul talks about everyone running a race but only one person gets the prize, you know, and, and he's using other sports metaphors, he was more than likely referring to the Olympic Games, which are a major deal in the Greek world at that time. To understand references and, and, and things that are talked about in the culture of the early church, you need to know a bit about the Greek and the Roman worlds. It's important to know the history that's behind the Bible and helps you understand a lot of the contexts of the verses. There was even one British major whose knowledge of the Bible in World War I helped them win a battle over the Ottomans and they got to a town called Mikmash and it sounded familiar to him so he looked up the scriptures and he found that this was the same place where the secret path where Jonathan and his armor bearer had went and snuck and defeated the Philistine garrison. And they used that same exact path that Jonathan and his armor bearer did to go and take over the city to outmaneuver their enemy. So we study to understand the word and we study to also understand who Jesus is, to know that he is God, to fully appreciate what, you, what he did on Calvary, you really do have to have a good understanding to truly know him. And you know, if your kid has come up through our class, uh, the teen class in probably the past nine-ish years, um, they can tell you themselves they've gotten a fairly, fairly heavy dose of doctrine up there. And I think they even hear about it in the, in the younger classes before they even get to the teen class. We've had doctrine Sundays. We gave them a test um, and we kept repeating the material until every single kid in that class Pass that test that show us that they understood the doctrine, they understood oneness, and they understood Acts 
238. You know, some people love studying the end times. Me, myself, I'm, you know, doctrine is one of my, it's my bread and butter. It's what I like to talk to people about. And I enjoy talking about it and, and teaching that stuff because, you know, in Genesis, God created it all. But in, in John chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things were made by Him. Without Him, nothing was made. And it later says, And that Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And Isaiah says, His name shall be called Wonderful. Counselor, the Prince of Peace, the Everlasting Father, the Mighty God. In Revelation 1, Jesus said, I am Alpha and I am Omega, the beginning and the end. And he went on to say that I am the Almighty. That's a capital A, Almighty. And if you look in a strong concordance, that word Almighty means the all-ruling that is God. So if anybody tells you Jesus isn't God, look in Revelation chapter 1. And I studied all that so I can try myself to fully appreciate what he did, that appreciate that the God of the universe decided to put a robe of flesh on for me, that he was beaten, mocked, and crucified for me, also that I could have a chance of salvation. He did all that because he wanted me to have a chance to spend eternity with him. And I'm starting to close here. And that, that knowledge that I have of who he really is came from digging into the word of God. So when I witness and so when I talk to people about the goodness of God and the love of God, the knowledge of oneness that I have that I can throw in there helps underline the importance and the greatness of the love of God that he did all of that. It wasn't someone else. It was God himself that put on a robe of flesh and came and hung on that cross for us. And so whenever I end a lesson upstairs, I always tell the kids to do three things to get closer to God. And Nicholas, he's here and he knows them. It's study, praying, and fast. Don't just read a few chapters and skim over a few chapters and be done. Actually dig into the Word of God, learn it, and you know, be excited. Have a passion to understand what it's talking about because there are tons of golden nuggets buried throughout the Bible, and you can find them if you'll just go and study it. So today I hope we all really take the point of this lesson to heart, and that's we must study the Word of God know it, and then know how to properly use it in our lives. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, God, we thank you, God. We, again, we thank you for your blessing, your mercy, and your grace for keeping cancer out of the church, our travelers safe, our soldiers safe, our children safe. God, we thank you, thank you for what you did at Calvary. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity, God, that, that we have to serve you, the, the opportunity we have to make it into heaven. God, God, get a hold of it. God, prick each and every one of our hearts. Give us, God, a greater desire to study after your word, God, to, to use your word. And God, and when we learn that word, help us to use it the right way, God. Help us to rightly divide the word of God. Help us to be effective and ministers and, and leaders and witnesses. God, help us to, to just do better to be a light and a witness to the world. And God, again, God, put that passion and that desire for all of us, God, to go deeper with you, God, continue deeper than we've ever been before, to, to become in love with your word, God, to where it's essential to us that we can't function without us. God, and wake up people who don't know that, God, God, enlighten them to that fact. Again, God, we ask God to bless all those that are suffering with this virus, God, uh, all those that have lost loved ones, all those who are on the front lines, God, move for them, give them comfort and peace and healing and move for them. Bless your churches, God, help keep everyone united together. Bless your pastors. Give wisdom and knowledge in this time. God, we thank you for the opportunity for us to be able to gather back in yeah. and have services that we used to. And God, we give you all the praise and glory for it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>